Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today, I've got a good story for you guys. I have once bought a Gibson for 400 bucks, and I thought that would be the best tale I could ever tell. But this time, I got a custom shop for only $400. Now, obviously, just like that last episode, we're, we're gonna have a little bit of a story behind this one. So, I was at the dentist office with my kids, and I get an email from a viewer of the show that says, Hey, I think you really should check this out. You're gonna want this thing. And it was just a Craigslist link, and they're like, If you need help getting this, just let me know. So naturally, I click on the link, and I immediately have to contact the seller. At first, he had a phone number on it, and then just your typical relay Craigslist stuff. But then when I refreshed the page, his phone number was gone. On. I knew this thing was gonna sell fast being so cheap. So I sent him a message asking if he would ship it I'm okay paying his asking price $220 plus whatever it costs to ship but five minutes goes by I haven't heard from this guy. I'm thinking Nobody on Craigslist ever wants to ship stuff. So I reached out to the fan again It's like I did reach out to him, but I don't think he's gonna respond. So he's like say no more Let's make this happen. So he proceeded to meet up with the seller after work gave him his money took it to UPS They charged him a whopping $200 for this box a little bit of bubble wrap and some of that ah man <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna complain too much though because 400 bucks for a custom shop Les Paul. I'm just thankful we were able to get it So yeah, obviously there might be a little bit of a catch to this <laughs> you, you don't buy custom shop Gibson's for 400 bucks, but you might be able to get this Inside here my friends sleeps not an optical illusion this is half of a Les Paul. <laughs> I love it. I love it so, so very much. And you might be saying, why? Why did you spend $400 on this? <laughs> it's a learning utensil. So if you don't know what this is, this is actually what the custom shop uses to train new employees as well as go around to dealerships to show them why historic guitars are built a little bit different and why you should pay a premium. So what they do is they take a factory second guitar that's not necessarily 100% functional. They bandsaw it literally in half. So you get half our fretboard, half our headstock. This is technically just a Sun, not a Gibson. <laughs> they even go as far as sawing our truss rod in half. But why you want one of these is the cross section. Look at that. So you get to see the maple top and the mahogany body, but most importantly, the long neck tenon. It shows you just how far the neck goes into the body, where you get the mahogany body cavity right there, as well as like the wiry channel route right there. But then you also get to see the side profile of the inlays, the fretboard, the neck, the truss rod, everything. Quite fascinating to be honest to see this, to see the inlay still there. So you might be saying, okay, so why, why did you buy this? I mean, you can't really use it outside of just, you know, basically a display piece. But if I do end up opening my museum, I thought this would be perfect because where else are you going to see one of these things sawn in half? Now, occasionally these things do show up on reverb. So if you want one for yourself about every three or four years, <laughs> something will show up. But yeah, I, I have no plans on selling this. But I was curious, could we put a tailpiece on here. Like if we really crank it down to the top, we might be able to get away with just having one, but then the string tension, I I don't think it would work. Like we could technically mount a P90 right here, but we would not be able to have any type of a bridge, I wouldn't think. Now, obviously we can actually get electronics in here, so that wouldn't be a problem because we still have this portion of the body. But even if we did put tuners on this, I don't think it'd be able to take string tension having only half a truss rod. <laughs> so as far as just stringing it up and playing it as is, yeah, I don't think we can do that today. But the other option that we have with this is what if we make our own half and half burst? We saw that in the Gibson Mod Collection demo shop, but this time we could like splice together two different guitars. I'm betting that would be way more trouble than it's worth. I'm sure somebody could potentially do it, but they would probably have to start with a whole Les Paul body and then just saw it and then glue it. Somebody might be able to. I think somebody was saying twofer. I mean, I guess I'd be open to it, but 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how far we're going to take this. Another interesting idea is if anybody has like P90s that don't work anymore or a collapsed ABR1 bridge that they don't need or some sort of a tailpiece, I think it'd be fun to get somebody to bandsaw those in half so we can still see that all together. That would be a lot of fun. But for today, I do want to throw this on the workbench to at least get a nice up close look at all of its stuff. Give it a nice clean. We'll do an air guitar demo. And then I think that'll just have to be it for this episode. All right, I'll see you guys on the workbench. All right, inside the half guitar. Why did I take the time to polish up a chopped up factory second? Don't ask me why. I love this little thing. <laughs> but let me tell you, these are the sharpest fret ends you've ever did done see. But let's go ahead and talk about this thing. So, now looking at it closer, I think this was actually intentionally relicked at the factory in this area. And I say that because the finish checking in this area is so much deeper, you can feel it when you're polishing the guitar. However, the more natural finish checking right here, you can see just the way that it reflects the light that you can tell it's just not exactly the same. So this is another deep finish check right there by the tailpiece. So maybe they were using this as like an aging prototype replica or they were trying to recreate natural checking by like banging the guitar against something. So that's a lot of times I get that. So it's a gold top finish. It's got P90 pickups. You can see that it was an ABR1 bridge. So that means this was initially a 1956 reissue. Of what year? I can actually tell you, but I'll wait till we get to the back side of the headstock. Let's take a look at these cavities. So normally on my show, I can show you this far. You have the long neck tenon where the neck joins into the body, and then that screw hole right there is where one of the P90 screws secures into it. So normally we have a happy face right here because of the mouth, and then you have a second eye, but this one was chopped in half. He's not so happy anymore. For some strange reason, I can't quite get any pickup readings out of our invisible pickups. But now we've got the side profile view. So here's where the neck comes in. It's at a little bit of an angle. You can see the glue line right here and how the neck protrudes into the neck pickup cavity. So a short neck tenon stops right here. Transitional is kind of like somewhere in between. And then you have the full on long neck tenon. But you might not have noticed this at first. I thought Gibson's had, you know, one piece mahogany necks on their historics. Why is it such a different color? Are they layering woods before we get to this metal truss rod? No, this cross section is actually a little bit misleading. And then it's like, wait, what, what's going on here? That looks different from that wood. So when Gibson makes their necks, I believe they're flat like this. And this is before the fretboard portion gets put on, that brown part right there at the top. They take a CNC machine and it just routes a little cavity out in the center. And then they inlay the truss rod into it. That's what you're seeing the metal bit right there. And then to cap off that route that they just did, they use maple wood. So that's why sometimes up here, if you take the truss rod cover off of a guitar and it doesn't have a holly veneer or anything on it, a good example of that is the 2019 The Paul reissue. You can see a little maple splice right there. It's not too big of a block. This cross section just makes it look a lot larger than it really is. But you can see right here, there's actually a different piece of wood. What on earth is that? That's the maple top of the body. But that is the end of the truss rod right there. We'll talk a bit more about the truss rod here in a minute. I just wanted to talk about how it protrudes into the body. So next up, we have our bridge pickup cavity. Now there's actually a route here that connects the cavities together, normally somewhere around here. And that is what this hole is. This is not to show you weight relief. But how many times have you got to look down that channel route with such clarity? Well, besides on my show where we use endoscopes, but I would say that's a little bit more clear than normal. But then again, in true Les Paul fashion, you have a maple top. You can see just how much wood they shave off in order to get the famous dish carve of a Les Paul. It's about half an inch thick there, and then it just stays there until about right here where it just kind of tapers on down here until it's about a quarter of an inch. Now, if this was flamed maple, we'd actually be able to see the flames in the cross section here too, but unfortunately, no. But there you can kind of see the carved dish top that we're talking about. It's going to vary in the multiple places of the body. 
But that's where the ABR1 bridge post goes directly into the body, and this is where your stop bar tailpiece goes in. If you're wondering why the paint's all messed up there, it's because there's actually a metal bushing in the body, and they commonly get painted over. Now, I think they're actually supposed to chip that away before they ship them out. So if you ever see that that hasn't been done, yeah, it's, it's normal for that to do that. And since this model has binding, I thought this was pretty interesting. I've never actually seen how binding is applied to a body. So that just appears to be a single layer that they wrap around there. If you ever watch one of the tour videos, they like wrap it in like a really tight cloth in order to make it stick with the glue. However, if you go up here, the way they do it for the fretboard is a little bit different. It appears that they route a little channel that they can just kind of press it into. Then obviously they glue it as well. All right, so moving on from the maple top mahogany body, we have the rosewood fretboard. We've got our celluloid inlays here. Those frets have been all polished up. They're looking good, but they could definitely use rounded off on the side if somebody was going to convert this into like some sort of a tenor guitar or something. But it's not every day you see the cross section of a fretboard. Because you see how this rosewood board has a nice dark streak? That's actually running through the middle of the fretboard as well. It kind of goes down there. I mean, all woods have their own unique characteristics to them. There you can also see your inlays at a cross section. Shows you just how thick and or thin they are. But let's look at the truss rod one more time. So we've got the end of the truss rod where it's all glued up, but what is this? I've heard that Gibson microchips their guitars. That way they can like RFID scan them. And I very well could be wrong, but I think that might be what that is. It's either that or I just don't know what I'm talking about. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that, which I probably am. But that's the only thing that I can think of. But this video wouldn't be complete without some neck specs here. So we've got a nut width of an absolutely skinny 0.85 inches. That beefs up to a boisterous 1.03 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.92. And then by the 12th, 1.03. And of course, a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length. Quite the interesting neck profile, 1st fret and 12th fret. They call it the apostrophe neck. Something else interesting about the truss rod is you see how it's bowing? This is how a truss rod works, is when you adjust it to straighten the neck, it just starts bending the woods up or down, whichever way you're trying to go. So it's either like this, like that, or like that. Now I can't adjust this truss rod because it's been sliced in half so I can no longer put a nut on it. But I found this quite useful to look at. You see these notches? That's as far as the truss rod nut can go in order to get some sort of an adjustment grip. So normally they would look about like this stock from the factory, the nuts on it so you don't see it there. So that means we've got about 0.6 inches of adjustment room on a Gibson style truss rod before you're going to need to reset it. Or in total from the top, just a little bit more than one inch. And when you start to see a lot of threads up here, what's normally happening is this wood right here is getting compressed and then this is no longer sitting where it's supposed to be. So your truss rod's not working 100% properly. And I found this quite interesting too. What you see right here, that's where the screw goes down to secure the truss rod cover. You can see another one right there. I mean, it's like almost touching the rod. So a whole bunch of interesting stuff sleeping under here. Now, yes, we do have the holes for the tuners, but again, I'm not gonna risk it. But now we can see the Gibson logo and the Holly veneer. So historic Gibsons actually have another piece of wood right here called Hollywood. And that's just a historic feature. Sometimes it's just a black veneer on like Gibson USAs. But if you ever see like a slightly lighter color wood outline around your Gibson headstock, no, that's not a defect. That's the way it's supposed to be. But here you can see the Gibson logo, the mother of pearl. It just looks like it's like inlaid on like a piece of ebony or something. They just put it in the headstock. So now we'll go ahead and flip it over to the backside. This is the stuff that we normally see on the channel. But the only thing we don't get a good cross-section view of is the ground wire, because normally that goes to this tailpiece stud. So they would have had to cut a chunk out of the guitar there on top of it to see that. But there you can see it's officially an R6, and they really did cut this down almost perfectly straight, because these marks right here are actually left over from the bottom strap button. So maybe not perfectly centered straight, 
In fact, I think they did it purposefully not straight, so nobody could actually end up restoring one of these. The only other interesting thing to talk about on the body for the historics, you can see the maple cap right here. That's called thin binding in the cutaway. It's a historic Gibson feature. You don't always find it on Gibson USAs or like 70s Les Pauls where they just use a wider piece of binding in order to cover that over. That's a very commonly mistaken for a defect on high-end Gibsons. But hey, there's a little bit of flame figuring right there in the mahogany body. Back of the neck can't really tell us too much, but this thing really got chewed up by something back here. Now that's not a crack, that's just a wood mineral streak. But you can see the outline of the tuners that were once on here. And I love this because generally historic style guitars can have a serial number like this. That tells you what model it is reissuing. So a 1956 reissue, then you have four digits over here. The leading one tells us the year. The other ones are like a production number. So yes, even though this thing is sawn in half, I can confidently tell you this started life as a 2004 R6. It's generally the early 2000s when you see stuff like this get circulated. Now to call this a custom shop training piece, I'm sure it has some valuable assets in that, but I really think these were probably just more so like display pieces in a top selling store to make people understand all the work that goes into them and why you should buy a historic Gibson. Because you gotta remember, this is the same era when they were doing like those demo guitars as well, like all the different pickup combinations that you could do. So it just makes complete sense. The story behind this one was apparently this guy might have been a Gibson dealer at one point in time or had a music store and he bought this off of a Gibson rep and then it just kind of sat in a closet. And if you want to talk about light, you won't find lighter than this. Three pounds, 7.2 ounces. Let's go ahead and hear how the legendary half guitar sounds. Invisible strings and electronics and all. Now that we know all about the half, Paul, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Was it worth paying about 400 bucks to get it to me? Of course. Maybe not to everybody, but you know, this will make a great future display piece. And it was a great learning tool, even if it's just for this episode, so everybody can get a piece of it. Now, as far as the tones out of the invisible pickups and strings, hey, not too bad. Sounds eerily similar to like a Gibson Dirty Fingers humbucker. I don't know how Gibson did it on this model. <laughs> But anyways, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at this dealer sample guitar, or whatever you want to call it. I'm happy to have finally gotten to document one of these. Maybe one day we'll find its other half. <laughs> Alright, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow for some more good guitar-related content. Take care.